Hi, everybody. Uh, I thought I would start out tonight by telling you something that isn't in my official bio. So it is true that I develop experiments and put them on the top of rockets and send them into space and map the planets. And it's also true that I lead MIT's plan for action on climate change. Um, but what you may not know about me is that I grew up as a young girl in eastern Pennsylvania in coal country. Both of my grandfathers were coal miners, and both of them suffered the effects of black lung. So the burning of anthracite coal really drove my community and was a central part of me growing up. So climate change is a very personal thing with me. We've known since the 1800s that the combustion of fossil fuels puts CO2 into the atmosphere and that the effects can be damaging. You know some of these effects. Rising sea level runs the risk of inundating coastal cities. Ocean acidification will wreak havoc with ocean ecosystems. Countless species of animals and plants will go extinct because they don't have the ability to adapt to the, clim the changing climate on the time frames that these changes are happening because they are occurring, happening. They are happening faster than at any time in history. And finally, there will be mass migrations, climate refugees who have to leave their homes and be taken in by others. So we are already seeing some of these effects happening and other effects that are happening. But I'm here tonight to tell you that I'm optimistic that we can avoid the worst impacts of climate change. Because if we look at our past, there have been countless instances in history where technological developments have moved humanity onto a better and more productive past. And then I have no reason to think that the future is really going to be any different. OK, so tonight I'm going to talk about three areas of technology development that, if they are realized, could really change the trajectory on which the current Earth is with respect to accumulating CO2 in the atmosphere and climate change. OK, the first of which is batteries. OK, we all know about batteries. You use them to charge your cell phones, to start your car. We play our music. But batteries are key to combating climate change. We need battery technologies because in the deployment of renewable energy, one of the greatest impediments is intermittency. So we essentially need to take the power of the sun and store it when the, for when the sun isn't shining, and we need to take the power of the wind when the wind isn't blowing. And with battery technologies, we don't need one breakthrough. We need lots and lots of little breakthroughs. We need better battery designs. We need better battery capacity. We need better battery efficiency. We need to develop batteries that are more inexpensive so that we can deploy them more. And we need batteries that are made out of common earth materials as opposed to rare materials. OK, the second example of a technology uh, is carbon capture. When CO2 is put into the atmosphere, the residence time is 1,000 years. So the CO2 that has been accumulating into the atmosphere since the time of the Industrial Age is going to be affecting the climate for many, many generations to come. So imagine if we had the ability, when fossil fuels combust, that we could capture the CO2 right at the source in the same way that an industrial stripper takes away pol pollutants at a smokestack. Alternatively, imagine if we could just suck CO2 out of the atmosphere, wherever it is, the same way that a vacuum cleaner takes dirt out of a carpet. So actually, technologies for both of these are being developed, but they're not anywhere close to being cost effective. And therefore, we can't scale them up. And actually, even if we could, we don't know what to do with all that CO2 once we have it. And so we need work in that area as well. And because of the fact that we don't have clean energy solutions 
for all the different parts of the energy system that now use fossil fuels, carbon capture has to be a part of at least our near-term solution for combating climate change. The third technology is fusion. Fusion is the process that powers the sun, and we need to bring that process down to the earth. The fuel is hydrogen, actually a form of water, and that makes it practically free and virtually inexhaustible. Now, the challenge with fusion has always been that we need to design a device that creates more energy than the energy that's used to power it. And this is a really, really difficult challenge. But fusion would be an important contributor to limiting the change in our climate because of the fact that it doesn't put CO2 into the atmosphere and there's no radioactive waste involved. So, batteries, carbon capture, fusion. Collectively, these and other technologies, that if we had them, we would be in a very different place today in terms of limiting CO2 accumulating into the atmosphere. So what do we do? Well, we need investments from governments, from industry, from philanthropists, and they need to be working together with scientists, technologists, and entrepreneurs. MIT has research going on in all of these areas, and I want to particularly note in the fusion area, uh, we have had over $100 million invested in a startup, Commonwealth Fusion Systems. And so, um, I want to close out tonight by returning to my own area of research interest and talking a little bit about space. What you see uh, on the screen up here is the famous image Earthrise, which is the image that really started the global environmental movement. This image was taken by the Apollo 8 astronauts on Christmas Eve in 1968, six months before the first humans landed on the moon, arguably the most important and interesting technological achievement in human history. Think about what was going on on the Earth at the time that picture was taken. Countries were at war. We had racial strife. We had intergenerational tension. We had economic uncertainty. And we had political turmoil. Sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? Okay. And yet, we still did this. Thank you very much.